Hi, welcome to the Talk Spot. This is Marcus, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Ar- Armitage. Uh, Mark, thank you, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Tell us a little bit about your story and what kind of research you do. Uh, well, I'm a microscopist. That's a microscope scientist, and um, started out uh, at the age of 16. I, I was invited to the National Youth Science Foundation a Marine Laboratory Station. Uh, off the coast of Portland, Maine for a summer, and I got bit by the microscope bug. And uh, so since the age of 16, I've been uh, working with microscopes, and I've worked for some of the big uh, optical houses like uh, Carl Zeiss. I worked for Olympus uh, and sold and serviced microscopes for many years, but then I went back and got my graduate degrees and uh, started teaching at universities and running uh, electron and light microscope laboratories uh, at several universities, the last one being uh, California State University. Uh, I have my own laboratory now, um, and I'm working on dinosaur soft tissue, of all things. Um, We've been able to use our microscopes to characterize all the different types of tissues that we're finding in these bones, and they're loaded. I, I made a prediction back in 2012 that Dinosaur soft tissue would be the norm in the fossil record, and my prediction is coming true. Hmm. So how does the scientific community, how do they view your work? Like when you say dinosaur soft tissue, I think maybe for some of our listeners that'll that'll be listening to this, um, I guess maybe explain to them why that's significant to maybe the person that says, okay, "Okay, dinosaur soft tissue, what, what does that mean to me? Right, exactly. And, and I deal in cells. And so uh, body cells, you know, we have red blood cells, we have white cells, we have uh, all different kinds of cells in our body. And uh, bone cells is one uh, very characteristic cell that we have. And these bone cells manufacture, they make our skeleton, they repair it. In fact, they recycle our skeletons almost every 15 years in a cyclical way. And uh, So when I found uh, bone cells uh, in the bones of dinosaurs, and not just bone cells, we're finding arteries and veins and uh, nerves and tendons and uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, I just just was uh, so shocked by it because as a scientist um, reading the technical literature, I wasn't seeing a lot of discussion in the literature about it. So I thought, man, people need to know this. Uh, I think it's a game changer that dinosaur bones are still full of soft cells uh, like these bone cells and uh, blood cells. We're finding blood cells. I mean, even in the, we we found blood recently in a 400 million year old Devonian lungfish bone. So um, this stuff shouldn't be there. According to everything I was trained in, and I'm a soft tissue expert in my training, for microscopy, according to everything I was trained in, this stuff should have been gone uh, many millions of years ago, and yet it persists. And there have been some uh, possible explanations offered for why this stuff is still here, but none of them really hold water. Uh, On on close investigation, these theories, uh, like the biofilm theory and the iron preservation theory, these things break down. They, they don't seem to be able to explain uh, for the beautiful cells. And I'm talking beautiful. I mean, you can go onto our website, uh, dstri.org. It stands for Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute.org, and see videos and pictures of these beautiful cells. So um, we just want to get to the bottom of it and understand why these things are still here and maybe uh, rethink uh, you know, the, the standard paradigm about the age of the dinosaurs. Hmm. Well, because according to the technical res- like data that's out there um, or the information, like when is it, I guess, thought or believed that dinosaurs like no longer roam the earth? Like how many millions of years ago is that speculated? Well, um, first of all, I don't think anybody can say that there are no dinosaurs on earth today because we haven't examined <laughs> every square inch of the planet. And so I think to be honest to the truth, we should be able to say as it, as it seems for now that dinosaurs are yes, completely extinct. Um, 
But when did they go away? That is a game of clue now, isn't it? Because we all have the same rock strata. We all have the same deposits, and they're all fluvial. They're all water deposits around the earth. And, and people are just interpreting the evidence through different lenses. And so the, the, the thing that's shocking to me is that there's so much soft tissue there that it really strains the credulity of the deep age, the deep time that has been ascribed to these creatures. Well, because if, if it is, so like what you're saying, so in, like basically encountering the soft tissue, I mean, how long ago then would, did some of these creatures die then? I mean, are we talking, again, for maybe for the people that don't necessarily, you know, fully understand like what this means, but like, I mean, are we talking like, the soft tissue is less than like a thousand years old or in the realm of like hundreds of no, years or a couple thousands or it's, it's probably, you know, based on historical facts and records, um, we, we, we didn't see, we haven't witnessed with our own eyes, the, the event that buried all these organisms in the mud that they're found in now. Um, so but our historical records for this continent, you know, go back a few thousand years. Um, um, you know, when you look at cave paintings and stuff like that, that can be dated. But, um, you know, even if, yeah, even if uh, we were to accept a million year age for the dinosaurs, um, you know, we know the tissue probably wouldn't last any more than that for certain. But in the quantities that we're finding it, it seems like it's more like 10,000 years old or less. Hmm. Because according, I mean, I mean, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, uh, when you do work in microscopy, you, as a biologist, you're constantly processing tissues. Okay. Uh, tissues have to be processed to go under a microscope and the protocols are very strict or your tissues begin to degrade really, really quickly, and you see those degradations under the microscope. Because, you know, when, when we prepare tissues to look at in the microscope, we're interested in the original morphology, the original shape of that tissue. What was it like when it was in the organism? Now, when, we, when I turn my electron microscopes to the dinosaur tissues, I see these stunning cells that look like they died yesterday. In fact, I presented my work at the Microscopy Society of America meeting in Hartford, Connecticut back in 2012. And um, one of the PhD researchers jumped up out of her chair after my talk and said, I have to work with you to try to culture, you know, bring alive these cells. That's how alive they look. So it's shocking to see them preserved so perfectly and down to like 200 nanometer sizes. Um, you'll see that if you go to the DISTRI website. But um, I don't know of any mechanism short of processing the tissues in the laboratory that can account for the presence of these tissues other than maybe they're not that old. Wow. And, and what kind of, I guess, dinosaurs like, have you seen the cells of? I mean, are we talking like, I mean, yeah, I guess, I mean, I only really know the big dinosaur names like Tyrannosaurus rex and raptors, but um, yeah. what, what kinds yeah. have you seen? Well, we've, I've been on three digs so far, and I've collected Triceratops, T-Rex, Brachylophosaurus canadensis, Nanotyrannus, and uh, multiple bones from each of those. And every bone, every dig has cells in it and tissues. They have blood vessels. They have tendons, nerves, veins, um, every single one. I mean, I, I, I'm 100% up at bat on these bones. And... I've even examined bones that were in a museum drawer for a hundred years and they still have soft tissue in them. So, you know, it's, it's dried out and it's mummified, but they're still there and they still react to different stains. We can stain them with very specific stains and tell that stain, go find me a nucleus and find me DNA. And it goes there and it finds it. And when you put it under a fluorescent microscope, that little spot glows because it's attached to DNA in the nucleus. So we're finding these things. And so they're still there. The, they're, the original proteins that were in these cells and tissues are still there. How is that possible? 
Mm. So how is like I guess like how has the like how has the I guess academic community responded to your work? I mean how how have your peers I mean, how have they responded back to like your findings and basically everything that you said in the lectures that you've given and just yeah, how how have they responded back to to your work? Well, it's kind of interesting actually. Uh, most of the responses I get are from well, let's just say kind of not nice people online who have all kinds of negative things to say about me, but uh, my research papers are up on researchgate.net, and they've been read many, many times, but nobody is citing my articles, and I don't understand why. You know, when you write an article about an area of interest that you have, you do a review of the literature in your article, in your paper first, and uh, um, I mean, if you Google dinosaur soft tissue, my name and my papers come up. But if you look at the research papers that are being published, nobody's referencing my work. So I don't know really what that means. I think it's unfortunate because the work that I'm doing is adding significant puzzle pieces to this puzzle. Um, and I don't know if, it, if it's because I am a religious person, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is just getting this information out. And that's why we give it all away. We give it away on the YouTube channel. Uh, and we give it away on the website. Mm. So t tell us a little bit about, um, you know, I guess your well when you worked at like um, you know California State University in Northridge, like what was what was the situation there when? I, well, I mean, you told me this before we started the interview, but maybe go a little over like that story so people understand a little bit more of, I guess I don't want to say the consequences of your work, but just how the established. I suppose norms have responded back to you. You know, it was, it was exhilarating because I was a valued member of the biology department and frequently told so uh, by many of the professors and graduate students and undergraduates. My job was to train all three groups on the microscopy to show them how to use the instruments. I, I was sent to um, Pennsylvania to train at the Leica factory uh, and I was the on-campus person training uh, uh, the postdocs and the PhDs and the graduate students and undergraduates on the confocal microscope and the other microscopes that were in my lab. So when I started publishing, for example, I published a cover photo of soft tissues that I thin-sectioned on a cryostat, and it went on the cover of American Laboratory. Very beautiful cover. It was the December issue of 2012. And the whole department uh, gave me kudos, you know. They're like, yeah, that's what we want. We want you to publish. In fact, uh, one of the professors there who was editor in the journal Acta Histochemica asked me to submit a paper, and I did. And that's the one that was published, and everybody was very excited. And then two weeks later, uh, there was this witch hunt against me. That was my boss's words. He, he didn't understand what was going on either, but... Uh, there were several people in the department who teamed up to, to just get me out of there and get rid of me. And we found smoking gun emails, I mean, that, that implicated them. And that's why uh, they settled out of court with me for a very large sum of money because they realized they couldn't win the case in court. Wow. So this whole, the whole litigation and the whole battle with, uh, with CSUN, I mean, that, like that, has that ended? Or is it base, or is still things yeah. like ongoing? Okay. No, no, no. It, it, the case was settled out of court. We signed a, a, an agreement together and uh, went our separate ways. But if you just Google Triceratops lawsuit, the whole thing comes up. Oh, okay. I like that's a very uh, interesting and memorable name. Yeah. Okay. So I guess since since your time leaving that like leaving that institution, I mean, have you? gone to other institutions to teach or have you been like a fellow at other institutions? Um, no, I've retired now. I'm okay. in retirement, but, uh, I am, I'm pursuing the work, uh, pretty much full time. We started the Institute. Um, the dinosaur soft tissue research Institute is a group of five people and we have a board. Um, like I say, we're all volunteers and we all contribute our own money, our own money. We don't sell anything, but, 
we are a, a 501c3 organization, so folks can go to the website and donate, uh, and we would welcome that, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not a financial organization. We're a scientific organization, and uh, uh, we're just trying to keep doing the work and, 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 uh, and get it out there, give it away for free. Hmm. So you mentioned earlier about maybe this concept that perhaps like dinosaurs might, or some dinosaurs might still be alive today. If they were, do you think, would they be like smaller ones? Or do you think, I mean, are we, is it possibility that they could actually be like, like large scale, what people think about like Jurassic Park? I mean, would it, would it be something like that? Or do you think there might be some smaller species that are alive somewhere and you know, I don't know, the wilderness in Russia or Canada or something like that. Right. Um, well, you know, when you, when you look at the largest uh, terrestrial animals today, I mean, elephants come to mind. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, um, there are aquatic creatures, you know, the, the, the blue whales, the baleen whales are very large, up to 90, 100 feet long. Um and so, but, but we don't find many, many large bodied organisms. These apex organisms are at the top of, of their chain. And, um, most of the body plans that we see are rather smaller. Um, and so it would not be, uh, inconceivable from that aspect to expect the dinosaurs, if there are any living today. And there have been sightings of some things that are very interesting that people are trying to investigate, but it's always about funding, isn't it? But um, the other problem is, um, you know, you look in the fossil record and you find organisms that were huge in the past. I mean, uh, dragonflies with almost a five-foot wingspan and ferns that were 200 feet tall. Um, we see these in the fossil record. And so the, it gives the impression that, that the Earth was different in the past. Maybe the barometric pressure was higher because in order to oxygenate the tissues, the deep tissues of some of these ginormous uh, organisms whose bones we find in the fossil record, they would, the, the, the uh, barometric pressure, it seems would have had to have been higher uh, to allow deep, t- deep oxygenation of their tissues. So I don't know. It's all, it's like I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a clue game with, you know, a bunch of clues that we're all trying to figure out. But uh I think based on what we see in biology today, we, if there are any dinosaur uh, organisms left, they would probably be small and they'd probably be in places where no humans or other uh, threatening organisms would be present. That would be my guess. Hmm. I mean, could someone make an argument that alligators or crocodiles are in the same family as dinosaurs? I mean, could you make that argument well, or what, what would they be considered? Well, statistics can be made to say anything, as the old saying goes. But what I see um, when it comes to biological organisms, um, I see um, common designs. And so, so I'm more of an intelligent design guy. And so I see, you know, it's, it's like 747s have round wheels. You know, they, they've learned from the days of the tricycles and the little red wagons that round wheels work better on 747s and so it's a common design element that's employed across the family as it were of moving vehicles right so it, it, the, the concept applies for biology as well if you're if you're going to design uh, body systems that are going to perform certain functions like growing and repairing and you know healing and uh, eating and uh, creating offspring uh, those are all functions that, that require certain machinery, biological machinery, as it were, to function. And so why reinvent the wheel every time? We see these common commonalities throughout different kinds of organisms. So some people see that as descent with modification, which I think is a real stretch because uh, mutations are not a very good uh, uh, fuel for change. Um, they create more problems than they solve. And so I see it rather as dissent with design and things reproducing after their kind. Mm. So I, I wanted to ask you, there's, I guess in the, in the public um, 
I guess zeitgeist, whatever you, you want to say. I mean, it seems like there's been a lot more depictions of dinosaurs with like feathers, and they're trying. It seems like they're trying to really visually convey the fact, or at least in their mind, the fact, the the established scientific fact or whatever, in their mind, that you know dinosaurs ended up evolving into birds. I mean, from your own research, is this whole thing about feathers being on dinosaurs? Is this actually? real from what you've seen or is this kind of a largely just i don't know just a propaganda movement to kind of like to kind of you know extrapolate that that actually was happening i'm not sure it's propaganda and i think sometimes we we tend to suspect you know nefarious uh reasonings behind uh things that are presented but i I think i'll put it this way no one has yet shown me a compelling find where uh, you're, you're, you're looking at dinosaur bones in an undisturbed location uh, where the feathers are clearly a part of that organism. Um, you have to realize that <clears throat> these, these fossil deposits are underwater mud deposits. Okay? Um, it, it appears as if uh, whole groups of organisms were swept off the land into water, uh, and they were buried pretty quickly in thick sediment. And so, and then they were transported. For example, some of the work that we've done has shown that some of these fossils that we've been working on have traveled thousands and thousands of miles uh, from where they were first uh, caught up in the water. And so, this is a cement mixer. And so, you're going to be mixing trees and grass and dirt and and dogs and cats and and uh, birds and fish and anything that gets caught up in the water so so to look at a at a fossil deposit uh as some sort of pristine environment where the guy just laid down and died and was was covered gently and you know everything was kept there 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 are fossils that are like that but they're the exception most of this stuff looks like it was in a cement mixer so I'm not so sure that there were feathered dinosaurs. I'm not saying there are not. Um, it certainly fits with the paradigm that uh, birds are descendants of dinosaurs. But again, I look at it as descent uh, through kinds with the same characteristics. Um, so um, whether or not a, a bunch of birds got caught up with a dinosaur in a mud flow and they all got buried together, or if there was in fact a dinosaur with feathers on it, I don't think that's really been settled yet. But, but we have a tendency to run ahead of ourselves and make claims about things before we've really spent the time as scientists to noodle it out and figure it out. And so I think that may be what we're seeing right now. Hmm. So almost what you're suggesting is that you believe in something that maybe most normal people would call like microevolution and not macroevolution. Is that something that you would say you believe yeah. in? Like you believe in like, you know, that maybe household cats today shared a common ancestor with lions or tigers, but that, you know, wolves and foxes or something like that don't share a common ancestor with a whale. Like I, I haven't looked at the, the evolutionary um, chain in a while, but I thought I right. remember seeing something about how a whale and a wolf are related. I might be wrong. I mean, yeah. if, but is that kind of more of what well, you're talking about? I remember, about? yeah, kind of. I, I remember a lecture I went to where uh, this well-known paleontologist was discussing the uh, the common ancestor, you know, idea and trying to flesh it out uh, down to modern day organisms. And he drew a big question mark <laughs> on the board. <laughs> because it, it hasn't, you know, what we're seeing in these diagrams and in these reports, this is conjecture. It's scientific conjecture, but it's really conjecture nonetheless. Scientists will use phrases like, these data suggest that. These data uh, show us that possibly this. I mean, they're very tentative sometimes, and that's the way science should work. But then... Uh, the newspapers and the magazines pick it up and they make these grand pronouncements that, um, you know, I think after a few years of study or decades, we tend to get egg on our face because maybe we jumped the gun a little bit. So um, I, I really, 
what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say we all have the same data. We all have the same evidence. We have the same fossil record. We have the same characters that show up in the fossil record, but we're just interpreting them through different worldviews and different lenses. And so I think, you know, who you are as a person, how you grew up, what the environment was that you grew up in, what you believe about where you came from and where you're going, all affect your uh, interpretations of the same data that we're all holding. Hmm. No, I mean, I, I think that totally makes sense. And I mean, obviously, in a lot of ways, I mean, I know that the work that scientists do is very complex and it's very, you know, data driven, even if sometimes even if, you know, we disagree with what's being said. But, you know, when the media gets a hold of it, you know, it's it's got to be sensationalized and it's got to be OK. You know, Correct. we have to we have to make this in a way that it's on the cover of a newspaper, especially, you know, if we're talking, you know, 80 years ago where maybe more scientific type information was making it to general newspapers and you know, it has to it has to have a lead. It has to have some kind of angle that people can actually connect to. It can't just be, you know, well, this scientist, you know, their research shows that there's a potential that this or that happened. I mean, it's got to be, you know, Lucy, the ancestor of humankind. And, you know, that's a headline. Yeah. And, you know, I... Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I totally get what you're saying there. Um, so, I mean, I guess... So in your in your worldview and just like kind of even like what your work is showing to kind of you know to validate a lot of the beliefs that you have I mean do you think then it's possible that humans and dinosaurs like existed at the same time on the earth and humans in the way that we think of humans today not maybe the way that you know maybe mainstream science would depict humans as being you know almost like neanderthal types or you know, very underdeveloped, but I mean, do you think it's possible that people like us, like people that existed and could speak and could use tools and stuff existed at the same time as dinosaurs? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, not only is it, is it uh, possible, I think it's probable. I mean, we're, we, we find uh, hundreds of depictions of things like Stegosaurus, on these uh, Inca stones that have been carbonated to be pretty old. And the, the Thai temple in Thailand that has a, uh, a, a carving in the stone of a stegosaurus. I mean, we, we, have, uh, we have archeological data that suggests that these organisms were not unknown uh, to, to the general population. In fact, China uh, you know, uh, 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 has a rich history of dragons in their culture and um you know some of these organisms uh, could have lived up until modern times uh you know 2000 years ago or something but um and there are there are plenty of stories of of these dragon hunters you know from from England and whatnot uh so it's all part of our cultural makeup and I, so so i would say not just uh, possibly i i would say probably uh man and dinosaurs did exist together uh, I think I think we got plenty of evidence at hand to show that, but then of course, as as a a, a religious person, you know, um, I bank on the Bible, the best selling book in history, and to this day, still the best selling book in history. There's a reason why, but uh, and it as a student of the Bible for close to fifty years now, it's just so logical and it fits with my science so well. I don't have to throw out my brain. You know what I'm saying? to to accept that all these things were created in the beginning and not so long ago and that a judgment of god the flood um you know put us in the state that we're in the whole world in the state that it's in right now um and in fact it i find it compelling that so many millennials are so aware of global warming. I know there's a lot of discussion about it, and I don't think the scientists really come down solidly on one side or the other. But the fact that um, Jesus said, I've come to bring fire on the earth, and Second Peter says that the earth and everything in it is going to be burned up with fire, I just find it interesting that so many millennials are starting to feel that heat. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I guess that kind of leads to a question that, that I was wondering is that just in your own field, I mean, especially because, 
you know, you're a scientist in in a hard science. I mean, you're not, you know, you're not a PhD in, you know, political science or English or something like that, but you're in a hard science where you've had to read, you know, you, you're reading all of this literature, you know, you're taking all these classes, you've taken, you know, dozens of class on evolution and micro, you know, micro evolution and all, all this stuff. I mean, do you feel like, I mean, is it, do you think, I guess when it comes to the hard sciences, I mean, do you think that they're out and out just anti-Christian or anti-religious or is it just the people themselves or the institutions, are they just so humanistic focus that it's just kind of like they just throw everything out where they say, okay, well, you know, we can't believe this because of this. Or, I mean, do you, have you seen that kind of that, that like maybe even like inner conflict that some people have had where people just like yourselves were people that are very, you know, very well read and very well educated and have a, you know, a very advanced degree that, you know, 99 point, 8% of the population doesn't have or whatever it may be. I mean, do you see this kind of inner conflict between what the institutions are saying rather than what like the Bible says, or, you know, just maybe potential other beliefs that the person has? Well, I think first of all, we've been very successful in this country and getting uh, religion and Bible out of school. Uh, Well, I I wouldn't say religion because there are many religions being promoted on college campuses across the country. Um, but um, they, not many of them are, are uh, biblical Christianity. But that, that's one thing. But I, but I also would say, in defense of many of my scientific colleagues, um, I think the majority of people are, are honestly seeking the truth when it comes to science. But I think a few apples, uh, and this personally happened in my case, a few bad apples ruined the whole bunch and what i what i experienced in my department was that these couple of powerful people exerted control and everyone else kind of froze in place and because i went around the department asking people why i was being terminated the reason they gave was because uh there was not enough money to support my position but i was only 20 hours a week anyway uh and the demand for my lab was growing like crazy and so most of the people that i interacted with as scientists were truly just interested in the science and not in uh you know grinding some axe over it but uh when these powerful these power brokers came up and stood up and determined to be rid of me, and we proved that it was a religious um, um, attack on me. Um, we, we got the smoking guns. Um, they, they, others in the department just kind of froze in place, and they wouldn't get involved one way or the other. Even if they had been antithetical to me in the in the in the past, they everybody backed away, <laughs> mm. and and because I think they were afraid. I think I think. People in biology, you know, my career of choice, are afraid of losing their jobs and their tenure and their position and getting a reputation. I have a reputation now, and I probably would, could never be hired by any biological imaging department to run a laboratory. Uh, certainly in a secular institution, maybe in a religious institution I could. But there's so much stuff that's been written about me online that... You know, I'm a pariah now, and so my career was ended by a couple of powerful people in a department. Now, the, the university paid for it, um, but they didn't pay for it because they're still in power, and they're still exerting control over those poor folks in the biology department who might be afraid of expressing their own personal religious convictions, you see. So... Um, that's what people are afraid of. They're afraid of losing their job, losing their career, being labeled the pariah, being labeled a person that uh, is uncooperative or not a team player or can't get along with others. And that's what they tried to do to me. And I think they were largely successful at it. But I think the hearts of most scientists um, are uh, really dedicated to finding out the truth of the science behind what they're studying. Mm. No, I mean, I think you raise a good point. I mean, I, you know, I, I went to a school that, you know, that you taught at and, and I was in a graduate program there. And I mean, I know that there was, you know, there's always that 
assumption that, you know, oh, all colleges are basically the people that are teaching it, and especially when I went there in the past where it wasn't as politically charged as it is today. But there was always that assumption that's like, oh, every professor is, you know, a very, you know, they, they have a very particular worldview. Let's just say that. And their views fit into that and it seeps into everything that they teach. And I mean, in my own personal experience there, um, I kind of felt that. Like, I kind of felt like yeah. a lot of the professors in my undergrad and graduate degree studies, um, that they really all did kind of fit a very similar mold with how they believe things and their worldview and everything like that. But again, for myself, in comparison to you, is that, or at least, you know, again, I only studied, I mean, whereas you taught, but I mean, I was in a, you know, I was in a social science. <laughs> so there's a lot more room for, you know, you you could both walk away, you know, somebody could say something like, oh, you know, I, you know, I think George Bush was an okay president, let's just say, for example. And someone could say, oh, well, he's right. the worst president ever, even though now, I mean, I'm sure people would talk way more about Donald Trump. But let's just say that, for example, George Bush, um, you yeah. know, it's really hard to define, OK, well, what's good, what's bad? And let's go through the metrics, whereas in your field, I mean, it's it's pretty concrete where they say, well, look at this and here's the facts and all this stuff. I mean, it's a lot less room for finagling, right? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, again, everybody's terrified of losing their career in biology. So they genuflect to evolution because it is expected of them. And if you stand up like a nail not fully pounded into a board on the issue of creation evolution, you'll get pounded into the board um, because that's the way uh, biology works in secular institutions. Now, a lot of these professors are probably parroting the party line, uh, maybe because they believe it, maybe because they're somewhat convinced, but certainly because it's expected of them in order to keep their job. You can't really keep a job in a biology department nowadays if you uh, refuse to genuflect to evolution. And if you have questions or, or concerns about it, you don't express those because it's job suicide. And that's you know, by publishing on dinosaur soft tissues, uh, I walked into a, a job suicide situation and they were more than happy to pull the ripcord on me. Do you think like, let's just like, if we were going to speculate, let's say, you know, 25 years from now, where do you think the field of biology will be in regards to the idea of soft tissue and dinosaurs and the idea that, I mean, I guess... I mean, I don't know if someone would say it other than the fact that maybe the earth isn't as old as some people speculate it is slash there's a potential that ma like macro evolution, you know, isn't real. I mean, at least what I call macro evolution, I'm sure there's more of a scientific term than that. But I mean, do you think 25 years from now, I mean, uh, maybe, I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of a time where it's a little ways away, but not in the way distant future where it's hard to speculate. I mean, do you think that these ideas will be taught more or at least spoken about more openly in a classroom setting? Or do you think it'll be the complete opposite where, you know, somebody raises points that are, I guess, are against the scientific norm today, so to speak, that they'll just be ostracized or if they write a paper on one of these topics, they'll just get an F or, you know, the teacher's going to give them, you know, a major side eye and say, oh, here's this guy again. Yeah, I'm going to just give him a, a C so I never have to see him again. But, you know, I'm definitely not going to give him an A in my class. I mean, where where do you feel like where do you feel this like the field will go? Well, if if uh, human past history is any indication, uh, things are not going to get better <laughs> for those who want to show the world that the dinosaurs might be young because of all the soft tissue in it. I think. Um, I think human history shows that. I mean, you know, you mentioned the presidency, and of course we have these cycles in uh, in, in presidential administrations. Um, we we tack one way, one set of four years, and then we tack another way, you know, uh, maybe in an opposite direction. And so somehow by tacking back and forth, we we do kind of ride down, you know, a middle medium that's good for everybody. But a lot of people are shouting even now, you know, today over the president and what's going on in his administration. But um, the, the point is that uh, humans have a heart problem 
And we struggle every day with whether or not we're going to love people. We struggle whether or not we're going to be nice to people or, um, um, you know, rise above our own personal challenges to be a giver. It's hard work to do that. And humans, as selfish people, generally fall back into, no, I'm going to be uncooperative and believe what I want to believe and the world be damned. Um, and, and so we have plenty of history to show that. Um, I, I think there's a lot of people who are reacting to dinosaur soft tissue because most of the population don't even know about it. Most people are shocked when I tell them, uh, you know, when they, when they download a free copy of my book off the website and they read it, they're shocked because nobody's told them this stuff before. And yet it's there. It's the truth. And um, so how is it going to be in 25 years? I don't think it's going to be much better. And frankly, my job is not to debate or fight or become contentious. My job is to take this information and shop it around. That's, you know, loosely termed because we don't sell anything, but give it away to people who have a real sincere heart and who really want to know what the truth is, no matter where the truth leads them. Mm. And, and so, but I think, you know, we have enough experience with human nature to know that we're not, we're not evolving into a better society. We're actually devolving as time goes on and it's not going to get much better. I don't think. Mm. No, I think you raise a very fair point. And I think that's even the true, existence or that's the true reason why science should even exist it's not to necessarily prove or disprove something it's supposed to bring up the facts and say well what about this and what about that but i think what you're saying is very true and i want to ask you one more question this might sound a little bit more like out of left field but there are some people that have written some books and there are some people on youtube that believe that uh dinosaurs were never they never existed they believe that all the skeletal remains are uh are just fake or whatever they're just you know basically the scientific uh community is just making them up i guess i, I don't also describe it other than there are some people that believe that they never that dinosaurs like literally never existed any of them i mean what would you say in defense of just dinosaurs ever existing like what would you tell them is oh well this or that like proves that they existed i mean i'm, I'm not even talking about timelines here i'm just saying i mean I'm not sure if you've heard that or not, but some people, they literally believe dinosaurs have never existed ever. Well, I'm sure there's a whole spectrum of responses that go along with uh, the existence of dinosaurs. In fact, a very good friend of mine who's now uh, wintering down in uh, Scottsdale uh, shared with me that he's so terrified of dinosaurs, he can't sleep at night if he thinks about them. And so... There's a whole host of responses when it comes to dinosaurs, and I'm sure there are people who make the claim that these are all fake bones. Now, I'll put it to you this way. If, if one of your listeners would donate the very tip of their little finger, that little bone, that distal phalanx on their, on their finger, just donate that little bone to me so that I can dissolve it and show them everything that's inside of it. They would see blood cells, bone cells, white cells, uh, platelets, uh, they would see veins, arteries, tendons, nerves, uh, vein valves, uh, osteocytes. They would see all these soft tissues that are in that hard bone. Now, if I take a dinosaur bone and I do the same thing, all those same highly complex things fall out of the bone. So if someone is planting fake dinosaur bones all over the world, then they're the best replicas that are ever known because when I deconstruct them, they have all the same things that your little finger bone has. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very fair, fair response. I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I've listened to some YouTube videos about this, about this idea, and, you know, and it, it's interesting to hear. I mean, I, I think there's something, I, I mean, this is, again, this is my own speculation about society. I feel like, there's something about dinosaurs that just seems so otherworldly. Like there's just something about those right. animals' existence that just 
I mean, it, they almost seem fantastical. Like they almost seem like they yeah. don't, they shouldn't exist in the real world. I mean, I know what you're saying. That I, like we have the evidence. I mean, I I believe that dinosaurs did exist. I don't know about today, but I know for sure that they existed in the past. But there is just something crazy about the idea of these gigantic lizard monsters, basically. That you know, yeah. Again, where terrible they, lizards. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, it's where they, you know. Were they all like, you know, Jurassic Park where they were going on a rampage all the time and killing and eating everything in sight? I mean, I I doubt that they were always constantly doing that. But yeah, I mean, there's just something about these animals that just seems not real almost. And I You're right. I, and I I agree. And I mean, out of all the animals, like again, let's just say we even go by the idea of, you know, what you know, mainstream science says, okay, fine. So there's been, you know, all these eras and uh, epochs or whatever. And, you know, dinosaurs are just a part of that. I mean, there's no other animal that has anywhere near captured the imagination of the public as dinosaurs have. I mean, there's all sorts. I mean, again, I've looked at some of the artwork and stuff for, you know, animals that were speculated to have lived, you know, 500 million years ago or something like that. And a lot of these animals, like, wow, they look, again, these are the artist's rendition. I mean, they look... Right. funky and they look weird and they look very alien but none of them have captured the imagination like dinosaurs i mean i i don't really know the answer why that is but there is something very unique about these creatures that i mean they're as popular in our world today as real animals in the sense of people talking about them and artwork about them and memorabilia and stuff i mean they i mean they, for all intents and purposes in a lot of ways they almost could be like real animals I mean, in the sense of like, yeah. in the way they exist in our cultural zeitgeist. No, exactly, and that's that's one reason why I was excited uh, to start trying to replicate this work in my own laboratory. When I first read about it back in uh, like 1999, I thought, no way. And there have been reports in the literature about dinosaur soft tissue since the mid 60s. I mean, this has been known to science for many, many, many years. And, but um, the scientists just didn't want to talk about it. And then Mary Schweitzer's work came along and exploded on the front pages. And then I was able to replicate her work. But um, they, they, they are otherworldly. They capture everybody's attention, everybody on the planet. I bet you, you could go to deepest, darkest Asia, you know, Go to the, the, the Russian frozen, you know, steps and a little child, show them a picture of a dinosaur and they know exactly what it was. And, and so this is why I'm so excited to be showing soft tissue to the world because everybody knows what soft tissue is. Everybody knows you bury your cat in the backyard and he's going to be gone in 10 years, right? And everybody knows what a dinosaur is. And so it really gathers its own spotlight and it's an intense spotlight. And in my case, I got burned in my career, but I don't really care about that. I care about those people who have soft hearts, who are really searching. They really want to know, God, are you there? Why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? And I think dinosaur soft tissue focuses all that beautifully because it says, I created you. God made, God made each one of us unique, and he wants us to live a happy, fulfilled life. In fact, he wants us to walk with him. The creator of the universe wants to walk with me. What a concept. And, and so there are people who are hardened against that, and I frankly can't help them. But there are people who are leaning towards it, but just need some assurance. And so if I can encourage them with the free materials that I'm giving away, to do walk and talk with God, then I think that's a good thing. I'm perfect. Well, definitely Mark. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I definitely have appreciated our conversation. Um, how can everybody, where are the websites and how can people follow your work? I know you've kind of mentioned them already throughout this interview, but maybe just yeah, yes. say one more time, like where are the sites and are you on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that? How can we yeah, kind of keep up with the, the daily going on that you do? Right. The main point of contact, of course, is the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute page. That's dstri.org. 
Uh, you can download in, uh, materials. You can go to the articles and updates page and get latest information. And there's also a contact page. Uh, you can download the papers uh, that I've published, and you can also uh, watch some videos there, and you can download the free book. And we're going to be developing a new book soon, and that'll be on Distry. Uh, if you like watching YouTube, I do have a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and you search my name, Mark H. Armitage, that channel will come up, and there's about 60-some videos there that go way back, all the way back to the beginning. You can actually watch my progression as I produce these videos and put them up. It's kind of fun to see how this affected me. But uh, all the work is there, and um, my email address is available uh, also, uh, um, and I can just give that to you if you want it. I answer all emails. Uh, even the crank ones. So, you know, if you if you feel compelled to send me a, a crank email, well, go ahead and I'll email you back. But it's it's micromark at juno.com. Okay, well, perfect. Well, thank you again, Mark, so much for coming on. I mean, I, I appreciate it. And hopefully you can come back on and we'll, we'll discuss another topic. And yeah, that'd be great. And like I said, yeah, thank you again awesome. so much. And yeah, have a good rest of your day. 